Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Human Biology here at Chaminade University. Today we will be discussing tissues and their organization. Let's talk about the different types of tissues first. So we have four major types of tissues. We have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. And the overall definition of a tissue is a series of cells that have similar shape and function that are going to be specialized for a particular reason. So a group of similar cells and proteins that are specialized for a particular function. And throughout this lecture, we'll be talking about the differences between epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous tissue. As you read through the chapter, we'll be talking about different types of tissues, and so they want you to consider the following. The small intestines contains all four types of tissues. What kind of epithelial cells line the lumen? Which type of muscle cell is found in the small intestines? And which branch of the nervous system innervates the entire digestive tract? And what types of connective tissue are found in the small intestines as well? So as we go through this, I want you to think about this, and we'll talk about this at the end. All right, so epithelial tissue is going to be any tissue that's going to cover and line the epithelial layer. It's going to be the tissue that's going to form boundaries between different types of environments. And it's going to allow things to go from one layer to the other. So it's going to make a boundary again between two regions and allow whatever type of biomolecule to cross that boundary. And it can cross that boundary from many different ways. Um, ranging from simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, filtration, secretion, and absorption. These are all different mechanisms by which mo molecules can migrate from one environment to the next. Epithelial tissue is going to include all of your glands. So all glandular tissue is going to be epithelial tissue. And we have two different types of glandular tissue. We have exocrine glands and endocrine glands. Both of these are going to secrete things, but where are they going to secrete? Do we secrete towards the surface of the skin, for example? Is it exiting the body? Those are exocrine glands. Or are we secreting internally into the bloodstream, such as a hormone, and those are going to be entering the bloodstream, so endocrine glands. So again, exocrine glands are going to secrete a substance into the lumen, into an organ, or into the surface of the skin. Good examples of this include gastric glands, which are going to secrete hydrochloric acid, or HCl. It's going to be in the stomach, which is going to help break down the food that's going to have been just chewed and swallowed. Um, and we also have sweat glands. These are going to secrete directly to the outside surface of the skin. Again, endocrine glands are going to be secreting internally. It's something like the hormone that's going to go into the bloodstream. Good examples of this are going to be something like insulin, which is responsible for regulating your blood sugar, and epinephrine, which is going to initiate that fight or flight response. Okay, so some characteristics of epithelial cells. One, they have polarity. They have one side that's going to have a basement membrane, and that basement membrane is going to be attached to the cells, and we have an apical side and a basal side. So what do I mean? Just like your, your house or your car has a top and a bottom, this cell actually has a top side and a bottom side that are going to attach either to the basement membrane or to the cells above it. Right? Um, we also are going to have attachment proteins, so regions uh, that are going to have proteins like laminin or integrins that are going to allow it to attach either to the basement membrane or again to the cells next to each other through such junctions as tight junctions um, or gap junctions. And we'll talk about the different types of attachment um, proteins and adherins that we can use to hold cells together or to that basement membrane just a little bit later. Um, another thing about epithelial tissue is that it is avascular. What does that mean? It means it does not have a blood supply. Um, and in that way, it's going to have been able to have access to the blood supply just under the basal membrane. And as it grows upward, it's eventually going to die off. Think of your skin cells, for example. The further it gets away from its vascular source, so it has a, a lifetime, basically. It's not going to live forever. Um, and along that time, we also have regeneration. So the bottom layer is going to be regenerating as that top layer is sloughing off. Um, it's going to also going to be highly innervated. So uh, we're going to be able to feel pain here, even though we don't necessarily have a blood tissue. So if you were to cut right through, for example, your skin, that first layer is going to not necessarily bleed, although you will be able to feel it. Um, all right, so let's talk about the different types of epithelial tissue. We classify epithelial tissue in two different ways, by the cell shape, and by the way the layers are arranged. And then we use both of those when we're discussing what type of tissue. So it might be stra simple squamous or simple cuboidal or pseudostratified. Um, and that actually only goes with columnar. And we'll discuss why in a moment. But we'll be using both of these to classify the epithelial tissue. So let's talk about cell shape first. So cell shape can be epithelial um, 
tissue that's transitional. What does that mean? That means that the bottom cells are going to be the ones, again, regenerating, making more and more new cells. And the top cells, which are typically the cells that are dying off or sloughing off, um, are going to take a different shape. So we're transitioning from a shape that's different on the bottom to a shape that's not the same on the top, right? Um, we also have squamous cells. Squamous cells are going to be flat. They're going to be very wide. Um, you can picture this. I like to picture this the difference between, like, the farmland and, like, the city, right? With the squamous cell, we're going to have the lots of space for each cell to take over. We're going to be very flat. We're not growing upward. In the city, however, we're going to have to make like apartment buildings and kind of climb on top of each other, right? So squamous cells, again, very flat, just a single sheet lining it. It's usually very tight here. You used to line like the bladder, etc. Um, we also have cuboidal cells, which as you can see, they look just like little, little cubes, right? Little buns of bread here, maybe. Um, we also have columnar tissue, which look just like columns. All right, so we can have multiple different ways that these layers are arranged as well. If it's just one layer, it would be simple. So we can have simple cuboidal, simple squamous, right? Um, <clears throat> simple columnar. We can also have stratified. Stratified means that we are growing on top of each other. And we're growing on top of each other, we're going to say that we have an apical surface, which is the top layer, and a basal layer. And what's that mean? That means it's the bottom layer that's connected most closely to that basement membrane, right? So again, this would be considered stratified. It would be stratified cuboidal. Um, or perhaps if this is drastically different, it might be stratified transitional. And then pseudostratified is kind of unique. Pseudostratified only happens with columnar cells. And here these columnar cells look nice and organized, but here they can kind of be tricky looking. Not all of them are going to make it all the way to the top. And if you were to just look at the arrangement of the nuclei, you might say that we had multiple layers like we do here. However, if you actually take a closer look, we only have one layer. We just have the nuclei arranged at different locations, and not all of the cells make it all the way up to the top. So pseudostratified is kind of a, a tricky one. Pseudo means false, in that it appears to be stratified, but indeed it is not. OK. So that was my overview, and now I'm going to tell you what I just told you. So this is the simple squamous cells. Again, squamous cells are going to be flat. Um, there's going to be a large area in between them. They're going to be connected generally to the basement membrane, nice lining. Here's a picture of what they look like. Um, squamous cells, again, they're going to have a not large area between them. We're talking more like farms than we're talking cities. It's a single layer of cells. They're flat. It allows for diffusion and for um, filtration. So we'll find this in the glomeruli of the kidney, for example, when we're filtering the blood into the urine. Um, no blood actually makes it into the urine, but the liquid that comes out of the blood plasma is what's going to then get turned into the urine. We'll get to that when we talk about the urination system. Um, and also, it's going to be involved in secretion. A good example of that are going to be the alveolar cells inside the lung creating a surfactant or a nice, um, it's a fluid that's going to help change the viscosity of um, the liquid inside there to allow for more diffusion to occur at a faster rate. So these epithelial simple squamous cells are found lining multiple organs. They line the heart, the blood vessels, the lymphatic tissue, alveoli, glomeruli, etc. So they're going to be a nice thin layer that's going to coat, generally going to form the serous membrane that coats your internal organs. We have regions that are going to coat the heart called the pericardium, the lungs, which is called the pleural, the abdominal organs, which are called the peritoneum. These regions are all going to be um, serous membranes that coat the major internal organs. And again, they're all going to be comprised of simple squamous epithelial tissue. Okay, so let's move on to cuboidal tissue. As you can see, cuboidal tissue, these perfect little um, little Hawaiian king buns here, right? A little bread. And here you have them also, perfect little cuboidal shapes. Each one of them has the nuclei in about the same area right along here. Really nice and simple. So this is a simple cuboidal section. It's going to be used generally to, um, this is going to be lining inside here. Let's talk about it for a second. So they're going to be found inside exocrine glands that are going to be secreting. Also going to be found inside the lumen of regions like the kidney, um, found on the ovaries, parts of the thyroid. It's a single layer of cuboidal cells going to allow for secretion of things out and also absorption of biomolecules in. All right. Um, all right. So ciliated, I'm sorry, columnar can be ciliated or non-ciliated. We have simple columnar here. This is actually going to be, instead of, remember we talked previously about it being pseudostratified, this is going to be simple. What does that mean? It means all of the nuclei are approximately the same level, and you can pretty immediately tell that it's columnar cells. We also have specialty cells here I'd like to take a moment to draw attention to. These guys are going to be goblet cells, and they're so named because, you, got, you guessed it, they look like a goblet under the microscope. Um, and we can have them ciliated or non-ciliated. A ciliated cell, these guys are little cilia here, Cilia are going to project out into the tract, perhaps into the lumen of the intestinal tract, etc., to help move things along. So cilia are going to remain in place, but they're going to have little, um, they actually are going to move 
things across them. So they'll remain in place on top of the cell and they'll make this little waving motion that moves things along. This is different from something called flagella, which would be found on a cell that wants to actually move through an aqueous environment, such as a sperm cell, right? The sperm cell actually would move from one area to the other. In this case, the cells are going to stay in one location. The cilia on their surface is going to move something, something like food through the digestive tract or um, sputum if you're talking about your trachea, uh, the, all of this in the, in the respiratory tract, all this would be moving something else along the cells. All right, but I digress. So this is what columnar looks like, a simple columnar that's just a nice column. And the functions of the columnar tissue um, is going to help move things along, particularly the ciliated cells that are going to things like form particles in the upper respiratory tract or in the reproductive tract, which we haven't talked about yet. It will help move the egg along, along in the fallopian tubes and then into the uterus itself for implantation. They're also going to be secretory cells, so they can secrete things like mucus, etc. They're going to be found in many locations throughout the body, including your upper respiratory tract, your sinuses, fallopian tubes, and the uterus. And again, cilia are they can be ciliated or non-ciliated, and cilia is just the little hair-like projections that move in wave-like patterns that are found across the surface of the cell. Okay, so non-ciliated simple columnar cells, just like we saw before, we have the simple columns, the nuclei are going to be in generally the same location, pretty easy to tell. These are all going to start at the bottom and end at the top. Um, all the same shape and size essentially. So simple columnar, these guys are non-ciliated and how do we know the difference? I'll go back. A second ago we saw cilia on the top. Here we do not see cilia, so they're non-ciliated, right? Um, and this is what it looks like if you look underneath the microscope. These are the nice columnar cells. Again, all the nuclei are going to be in generally the same area. Nice, easy to identify columns, therefore columnar. Simple meaning one layer, not multiple layers. And again, non-ciliated because we can't see any cilia hanging out into the lumen. Right? So these are going to be found mainly in the digestive tract, including the stomach and the anus. They're not going to be um, found in the intestines. Why? Because in the intestines we're going to have cilia. So we're going to have ciliated simple columnar in the intestines. Um, but we also find these non-ciliated cells in the gallbladder. These are all going to be secretory cells. They're going to secrete mucus. It's going to help protect the um, digestive tract from the digestive juices themselves. Remember that um, the digestive juices in the stomach are going to have a really low pH of hydrochloric acid, and that's not something the cells actually like. So the mucus is going to help protect the cells from coming in contact with that um, with that secretory fluid in the stomach. Um, all right, so again, they can be either ciliated or not ciliated. Sometimes they're going to have, I'm sorry, sorry, these are non-ciliated. The non-ciliated ones can sometimes have special projections called microvilli. Uh, microvilli are going to allow for absorption of nutrients. It's going to be able to allow us to absorb things that are going to be digested in our digestive tract. So it's going to also contain goblet cells. Goblet cells are going to secrete mucus. Again, that's going to help just keep the whole thing moving along. All right. So pseudostratified columnar are different from columnar in that they actually um, are, are going to be fully columns, right? But instead of the one we talked about, the simple columns before, simple columnar, the, the, everybody started at the bottom and everybody ended at the top. This is not the case. Some of them start at the bottom and end halfway. Some of them start and connect at the bottom but then don't make it all the way to the top, right? So it appears as though they're stratified. What does stratified mean? Again, I'll go back a little bit. Stratified means, oh, here, that we're going to have multiple layers. Right? Pseudostratified means that we have one layer, but it appears as multiple layers. So again, I'll go back to the pseudostratified columnar. So they're, they look like columns, and they appear to be stratified, but they are not. Pseudo is false. And what do I mean? All of them start at the bottom, and they don't all make it to the top, but we're not going to have multiple layers. It just appears that perhaps we do. And what do I mean? This is what it looks like under the microscope. It's kind of confusing. You see a lot of different nuclei, and it appears as though perhaps these nuclei are actually on top of each other, because again, remember, you don't see the entire section of every cell, just one cross section of it. So it appears like it might be stratified, but it is not. Again, it is pseudostratified columnar. And pseudostratified can only apply to columnar because the only time that it looks pseudostratified but is not is if it's in a column shape. Again, they can be ciliated or non-ciliated. Ciliated cells um, are going to be secreting cells. Um, they're going to be secreting mucus, also involved in trapping foreign particles, moving things along the tissue. Remember, the cells are going to stay in place, the cilia stay in place, but things are going to move across the surface, things like sputum in the re um, respiratory tract or um, in the digestive tract, the, the, cell, um, the food that you're digesting, right? <coughs> so... These non-ciliated cells are going to also be available. They're going to function absorption and secretion. 
And these are all going to be found in similar locations as your ciliated, ciliated, simple, and columnar cells. Mainly, they're going to be found in the respiratory tract, but we can also find non-ciliated pseudostratified epithelial cells in the epididymis, which is in the male reproductive tract, and in many glands, so it's involved in glandular secretion as well. All right, so let's talk about stratified squamous. Previously, we talked about squamous. Squamous are when we are very flat, right? Um, stratified squamous is when we get to the point where we are at the very top are going to be flattened and squamous at the apical surface. Note that at the basal surface, we are actually going to have more of a, um, a cuboidal shape. And that means this might be transitional. It could also be classified as transitional as well because we're going to have different layers here and different shape at the top. What is typically happening here, remember it's avascular, so these guys are going to have access to the blood because they're at the bottom and they're the ones that are new, they're babies basically. These guys are in kindergarten and then we get to middle school, eventually high school, eventually college, and eventually ending up in the, um, the old folks home, which is going to be this top layer here, this flattened squamous cell. These guys are going to be able to slough off um, like dead skin cells, for example. So oftentimes the ones that are going to be at the top aren't necessarily even going to be, they're going to be not necessarily as alive as the ones in the bottom. All right. Um, so stratified squamous cells are going to be the most abundant type of stratified tissue. This is when we have multiple layers, and the main purpose here is to protect the underlying or tissues from abrasion. And also, remember that abrasion opens you up to invasion by microorganisms. So if we cut ourselves, now we can have microorganisms like bacteria that are going to get in. So we want to make sure that we're able to have multiple layers to make sure that nothing actually gets into that blood supply here, right? In order to get into the blood supply, you have to go through many, many layers of tissue to be able to infect the blood. Okay. Um, the apical cells are squamous and the deeper basal cells are cuboidal. This means that we could possibly also classify this as transitional. All right, so we have ker keratinocized and non-keratinocized. What does that mean? Well, what is keratin? Keratin is a protein that's found in hair, skin, nails, right? It's a nice tough barrier layer. Um, so stratified epithelial cells that are found in the skin, for example, are going to contain keratin, which is going to be a protective layer to provide a tough barrier. We also have non-keratinized stratified epithelial cells. These are going to be found lining the, um, lining the respiratory and digestive tracts as well as the vaginal opening. All right, we also have stratified cuboidal cells. This is when we have multiple layers of perfect cubes. Very easy to see, right? They look very obvious as perfect layers of cubes. Again, here's the apical surface and the basal lateral surface. It's only called basal because it's lying next to the basal membrane or the basement membrane. Underneath this, we're gonna have other types of tissue. So again, epithelial tissue is going to line the outer layer, and then inside we'll have multiple layers underneath. All right. So what's the point of stratified cuboidal cells? Stratified cuboidal cells have multiple different layers. Again, they're going to have a protective function and can have some secretion and absorption properties found in ducts, like esophageal ducts, also found in sweat glands, mammary glands, and your sal uh, salivary glands. Here we have stratified columnar tissue. What does this look like? We have columnar cells, so they're in columns, not cubes. And we have more than one layer, so stratified means more than one layer. Again, anytime we have more than one layer, we're going to have the apical surface and the basal surface. And that basal surface is going to be lying right next to the basal basement membrane, which again is going to separate it out from one type of tissue, in this case epithelial on top, out to whatever it is that's underneath a type of connective tissue most likely. Stratified columnar tissue is not quite common, but um, what it does function in is protection and secretion. It's found in exocrine ducts. Um, and in such as the esophageal glands, for example, and in parts of the urethra as well. Now, as a really good example of transitional tissue, transitional tissue means that the one layer, in this case the apical surface, looks completely different from the bottom layer, right? So we have epithelial cells here on the basal layer that again look different from the apical surface. Here again, you can see very clearly we have one type of cells here and another type of cells there, okay? So that's going to be. Um, when we have two different layers. The function here is that we have characteristics of two different sets. Generally, it's going to be squamous and cuboidal. Um, transitional epithelial cells are going to allow a hollow organ to be able to distend and stretch. It allows us to be able to have, again, stretching reflex because the shape can start off cuboidal and then stretch into squamous, allowing us to have some distension. And this is going to be good for areas like the bladder, for example, that are going to need to hold liquid, the ureters, and the urethra. Okay, so that's going to summarize epithelial tissue. Now we're going to move on to connective tissue. 
Connective tissue is found everywhere throughout the body. It's the most abundant of the tissues in the body. And it has multiple different types of cells in there, as well as extracellular matrix, which is going to be comprised of some pretty strong biomolecules like elastin, et cetera. Um, which, so inside that extracellular matrix, we're going to have, again, this matrix has ground substances and fibers. And we'll talk about what's in there in just a moment. So what's the point of the connective tissue? Well, one, it's supportive and protective. It's also going to help transport things. It's going to store energy reserves. This is where we're going to find our adipose tissue, for example. And it's going to be involved in our defensive mechanisms. Inside the connective tissue, we have this matrix, which is going to be comprised of a ground substance, uh, like hyaluronic acid, for example. Then we have fibers in there, like collagen fibers, reticular fibers, elastic fibers, pretty much anything that you can think of that you can find in a lady's face cream that's supposed to help restore things what, like collagen, hyaluronic acid, reticular fibers, elastic fibers. These are all things that are going to be found in the connective tissue of the skin, as well as cells, obviously, are going to be found dispersed within this, um, this connective tissue. All right, so what kind of cells are we going to find inside the connective tissue? Well, we'll find cells like fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are going to help bind cells together. Um, but it's also going to be binding to things like collagen, elastin, and reticular fibers that are found in the extracellular matrix. We will find cells like adipose tissue. Adipose tissue are fat cells, multiple different types of fat cells, white fat cells, brown fat cells, right? Um, but we also have them loose and in, in conglomerate. So the loose fat cells are going to be found in the connective tissue. Um, we also have mast cells which are involved in the immune response. We have loose and dense found either in the blood vessels or also inside this connective tissue. Again, these are going to help mount an immune response when a foreign invader is found inside the body. We have chondrocytes which are going to be found um, in our hyaluronic cartilage, etc. Osteocytes that are going to be found in bone and blood cells, which are found in circulation, but also found in the bone because where are they created? Inside the bone marrow. Okay, so let's classify the connective tissue. We have multiple different types. We have proper connective tissue, supportive connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue. Okay, so the proper connective tissue is going to be defined as either loose or dense. We'll talk about that when we look at the images in just a moment. Supportive connective tissue is basically bone and cartilage. And then we also have fluid connective tissue, which is going to include your, um, sorry, your blood and everything that is going to connect your bloodstream to your extracellular fluids and your interstitial fluids inside your cells. Okay, so connective tissue has multiple different types of cells, different proteins, fibers, ground substances, etc. So this is an overview of everything that we're going to discuss, or kind of a lot of the things we're going to discuss. Here's our collagen fibers found right here. Um, we see a fibroblast here. Fibroblasts are going to use these, fi these collagen fibers kind of like as a walkway. They're able to crawl along and migrate. Fibroblasts are involved in healing, um, in wound healing, regeneration, and repair. Here's plasma cells. Um, here we have eosinophils, neutrophils, these are all going to be different types of white blood cells. Here's our red blood cells, right, they're anucleotic and dimpled, they're found inside our, um, our capillaries. Here's another series here of a fibroblast that's moving along our collagen fibers. These guys here are mast cells, they're involved in the immune response, as are these macrophages, also involved in the immune response. Um, so let's talk about the different types of connective tissue. We have loose areolar connective tissue, which is depicted here. It's going to be where we have reticular fibers that are going to be kind of small. We have adipose tissue. We have fibroblasts. Again, they're moving along here, these collagen fibers, mast cells. And it's going to be a whole hodgepodge of different types of cells that are moving around inside here. So it's loose areolar tissue because it's not necessarily defined by having a structure and order, but we are going to find lots of different things that are found throughout here, including, the, again, the adipose uh, adipocytes, uh, mast cells, plasma cells, elastic fibers, etc. This is what it looks like if you're going to be looking at it underneath the microscope. Um, and it's the most widely found connective tissue. Its function is going to be for strength, support, and elasticity. You can see that these fibers are maybe going to be able to stretch a little bit, so this is going to be able to move around quite a lot. It's found around epithelial tissues like in the sub -Q layer and the dermis layer of your skin, found in mucous membranes, blood vessels, nervous tissue, and in all major organs. All right, adipose tissue or fat cells. Here's adipose tissue here. Basically, it's a big adipocyte. It has the little nucleus 
found on the side and then fat storage inside these cells can get larger and larger and larger they eventually slit we get more and more of them what's interesting though is when you lose weight when you start burning this fat off we don't ever lose the cells the cells can shrink but we don't ever lose the amount of cells so if we've doubled multiple 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 cells then someone who has found themselves in a severe weight loss program may end up with the extra skin or extra adipose tissue even though the adipocytes have been depleted they still have more of them than they would normally have and resulting in skin that has to be removed um, okay, adipose tissue, again, this is going to store fat. What do we use fat for? Fat is used to produce energy. So triglycerides are the fat molecules in your body. We use that to produce ATP. ATP is our energy carrier molecule that's going to be used for all of metabolism. And adipose tissue is also serves to insulate the body, protect and cushion your organs, and also helps with temperature control for, not maybe not with humans, but with things like um, marine animals for certain. Uh, blubber, for example, is adipose tissue. Um, so adipose tissue is connective tissue that's found wherever there's areolar connective tissue. So it's found within the areolar con um, connective tissue. Generally found in the sub-Q layer of the skin. If you've ever um, pulled the skin off of a chicken and had the skin pull very easily off of the meat itself, what was connected there that got pulled off is the, um, that loose connective tissue. When we can see generally that fat layer is going to be the layer that pulls or separates out the skin from the muscle underneath. We're also going to find this connective tissue in our blood vessels, in our nervous tissue, and in our organs. This is what loose reticular, so we're moving on now, another type of connective tissue is loose reticular tissue. This is what loose reticular tissue looks like. Here's our reticular fibers. Again, it's called loose because it doesn't have a specific pattern. There's no rhyme or reason, but we are finding all of the things that we expect to find here, including our reticular fibers, again depicted here if we're looking under the microscope, as well as reticular cells, which are shown here by the nuclear staining. So this is a type of connective tissue that's found in many organs like the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes. It's also found in bone marrow um, and in smooth muscle. It's going to be a structural support system. It's going to be found around the basement membranes that are going to surround the organs and the blood vessels. It's going to serve as a filter to help get rid of old red blood cells. Again, the spleen is going to help digest old red blood cells. It's also going to help get rid of pathogens that are going to be transported to the spleen and to the lymph nodes for digestion and destruction. All right, so here's our next set of connective tissue. We have um, regular dense tissue and dense irregular tissue. I'll just show you forward what, they, what the difference is, right? It's clearly just by look. It's going to look kind of marbleized. This looks very structured and ordered. I'm going to have similar things in here, though. We have lar bits of, large bits of collagen fibers with fibroblast cells in between. And the dense regular tissue is a kind of a connective tissue. This is going to be very important in our tendons and ligaments and the regions that are called aponeuroses, and these are sheet-like tendons that are found, generally they're going to be found over our head, um, that are going to connect muscle to muscle. And we'll talk about that when we talk about um, tendons, muscles, and ligaments. All right, so this is going to be a type of tissue that's going to strong, form strong attachments. Again, it's going to be for connecting muscle to bone and bone to bone. Tendons are responsible for connecting bone to muscle. Ligaments are responsible for connecting bone to bone. And this is how the skeletal muscle, skeletal system and the muscular system and the nervous system obviously work together to coordinate body motion, right? So when we fire from the electrical impulse from the nerve, it makes the muscles move, which then pulls on either the tendons or the ligaments, depending. So pulling on the tendons to move this part of the bone and then bone to bone will be pulling on ligaments. And that allows us to move um, throughout the well, throughout our day, right? So this is going to be a really important connective tissue that has a lot of parallel strands. Again, we saw they all run in a very nice structured order. Then allow it to be very strong. It does not have very much um, blood supply, so it's avascular tissue. That means that injuries are going to heal very, very slowly compared to some other things like muscle tissue, which is going to heal a little bit faster. All right, so dense irregular tissue is going to have similar things, namely those collagen fibers, the elastic fibers, fibroblast cells hidden in between, but it looks a lot more marbleized, it's a lot more irregular, it's not going to be having a very structure, orderly structure that we might expect. It's going to be connective tissue that surrounds the muscles, so it's going to connect what we make what we call the fascia, or the fascia, the fascia is going to surround muscles. It's also going to be found surrounding the heart, so the heart is going to have the pericardial layer that surrounds them. Bones are going to have the periosteum that surrounds them, also found in the digestive tract, and forms the lower dermis region of the skin. 
All right. Again, these guys are not going to be parallel. They're going to be have a random arrangement. They're going to be have a sheet like a connective tissue that's very strong. And the reason that it has that strength is because it provides strength and pulled in many directions. No matter if you pull this way or that way or this way or that way, you're going to have really strong connection. Whereas if you look at this dense regular tissue, if you pull from here to here, you have a lot of strength. But if you pull this way to that way, it might just rip apart, right? Like if you pull paper towel one way, it tears very easily. The other way, it doesn't tear as well. Um, and so dense regular tissue is really nice when you're trying to keep things in a nice order function like again ligaments and tendons where you're pulling from one direction only but if you're pulling in multiple different directions dense irregular tissue is going to be the way to go because it allows you to have strength no matter which direction you're pulling from okay so another type of connective tissue is dense elastic tissue. It's called elastic tissue because it's able to expand and contract. You can see here this is going to have a little bit, have the ability to have elastic recoil. If you pull this way or that way, it can stretch out and pull back. And that's due to these elastic fibers that run through right on through there. We also are going to have fibroblasts just like we saw before. Um, and this dense elastic tissue is going to allow us to have a good amount of stretch and recoil. It's found in areas that need to stretch, such as your arteries, for example, that are going to have to take the blood flow from the heart, lub dub, lub dub, right? Every lub is going to have a high pressure and then a low pressure, then again a dub, high pressure. Um, and so it's going to constantly be stretching. Other areas of stretching include lungs, constantly breathing, your right, trachea, constantly breathing, bronchial tubes, your vocal cords, like I'm using right now to speak to you. So it's going to allow this um, tissue to have a good bit of stretch and recoil. Another type of connective tissue is cartilage. We have hyaline cartilage and reticular cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is going to be comprised of these particular little lacuna. What a lacuna? Lacuna just means holes, right? Spaces. Inside the lacuna we have a chondrocyte. Chondrocyte is going to be what is going to help create cartilage. Here we have ground substance. And cartilage can be a precursor to bone in some cases. It can ossify and become bone, in, for example, during the process of um, embryonic development. Or it can be a connective tissue that's going to connect. For example, it's found in our ears and in our noses. So even as adults, we do retain a good bit of hyaline cartilage. This is what it looks like underneath a microscope. It's pretty easy to identify. The lacuna are going to be those empty spaces. And inside the lacuna are going to be your chondrocytes. They look a lot like vana or sea urchins when they're found inside the rock, right? They carve out their little hole for themselves. And then they just kind of sit within that little hole. Hyaline cartilage is very strong. And it's a smooth surface for joint motion. Um, it does not have any blood vessels, so it is avascular, and it is one of the weakest of the three types of cartilage and can be fractured. Um, so although it's not a bone, you can still break it. Um, it's connective tissue that's found at the end of long bones, found in the ribs, the nose, the trachea, the larynx, and the bronchi, and most of the fetal skeleton is going to be comprised of cartilage, which will then again ossify into what we now know is, will become bone in the adults. All right, this is elastic cartilage. Very similar to what we saw before, except that ground substance is now going to be filled with elastic fibers. We still have our lacuna with our chondrocytes inside. Again, it's going to look like this, lacuna, chondrocytes. And these are going to be all these elastic fibers around side. Elastic fibers is going to be strong and strength. So elastic cartilage is going to allow us to have elasticity. And it's going to be found, for example, inside the epiglottis, which is going to be the little flap at the back of your, um, well, not the back of your throat, um, and going down the throat a little way is that allows us to separate off when we swallow so that food doesn't go into our trachea. So it separates out our trachea and our esophagus. Normally it's open, so when we're breathing, air goes down the trachea, but when we swallow, it closes off, funneling the food down the esophagus. It's also found inside the, um, connective tissue is also found inside the external ear and the eustachian tubes, which are going to connect the inner ear to the throat. So when you equalize your ears by holding your nose and pushing pressure out, it's the eustachian tubes that are going to connect these two areas, again, the inner ear and the throat. Okay, so fibrocartilage is going to be the type of cartilage that has these collagen fibers that connect. So previously we saw the ground substance with elastic fibers for the elastic and for the hyaline, just the ground substance. So we're getting more complex as we go. Here, instead of having the ground substance, now we're going to have collagen fibers. They're going to be organized similar to that irregular tissue. Um, and again, we're going to have our chondrocytes that are found inside the lacunae. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. Um, again, chondrocytes found inside lacuna area. And this is going to be our collagen fibers. We also have fiber cartilage, which is the strongest type of cartilage. 
um, I'm sorry, we were just talking about fiber cartilage. It's the very strongest type of cartilage. It's going to contain thick collagen fibers. Again, it's going to help connect different structures together and act as shock absorbers. Um, it's found in multiple regions that need to have shock absorption. For example, your intervertebral discs of your back, your knee joints, your pubic symphysis, and your hips. So regions that are going to be connections between two different bones um, that are going to allow for those bones to be able to um, have shock absorption between them so that they don't actually come into contact when you're, for example, running. All right, so let's move on to the next type of connective tissue here. That's going to be bone. Bone is going to be very similar to what we saw with cartilage, except it's going to have ossified. What do I mean by that? There's going to be calcium deposits that are going to make it hardened. So again, we still have our lacuna, but instead of having chondrocytes inside, we're going to have osteocytes. Lacuna is still going to be little holes that have the cells inside. In this case, the cells are osteocytes because they're found inside the bone. Surrounding that, we have that ground substance, which has become, again, ossified, nice and hard. Um, and inside these, we have these regions. So inside each of the osteons, this whole region is called an osteon. So if you hear osteo, you know you're dealing with bones. Um, osteocytes are the cells inside the lacuna. Osteo, osteons here are going to be this whole little tree trunk rings or series of rings. And inside the osteon, we're going to have a hollow region that's going to have blood supply, arteries and veins, as well as nervous tissue. That's why when you break a bone, it hurts a heck of a lot. Okay, so bones are going to be moving when muscles contract. And basically, it's a combination of the nervous tissue innervating the muscles, which the nervous tissue fires, causes the muscles to fire, causes the bones to move when the muscles contract. Bones are really important also in calcium and mineral, mineral homeostasis. They provide a reservoir for calcium and phosphorus. We'll talk about the calcium bank in a little bit. But basically, when you're younger, you're putting more calcium in than you're taking out. And as you get older, you start taking more calcium out than you're putting in. And so you start drawing against that calcium bank and leaving holes in your bones that causes all what we call osteoporosis. Um, but I digress. We'll talk about that when we get to the bones. Um, but the other option, the other purpose of the bone is to protect the internal organs. Picture like your ribs, for example. Um, they're going to protect your heart and your lungs, etc. The red bone marrow is going to produce um, the red blood cells and the white blood cells. And the yellow bone marrow is going to be the area of fat storage. Okay, so bones are going to be connective tissue that are going to be found in the long bones like, and also the skull, the ribs, the vertebrae, and the pelvis. So we're going to be calling this the appendicular, for appendages, and axial skeleton. Come on, here we go. All right, so another connective tissue is the blood. So when we talk about the fluid connective tissue, we're talking about the blood. And when you think about blood, you just think about red blood cells generally, but there's a lot of other things in here. So here's our red blood cells. They are anuclear. They are going to have, so that means they have no nuclei. They're going to have little dimples, a little torus shape, and they're going to be perfect sites for oxygen delivery and then carbon dioxide to be picked up as well. Here's a white blood cell. It's one of many different types of white blood cells. Here's multiple different types of white blood cells shown all at once. Examples include eosinophils, uh, neutrophils, basophils, but these are basically all going to be involved in the immune response and in helping to keep your blood supply clean of foreign invaders. We also have these little guys here that are platelets. Platelets are really cool because they have two different versions. You can see this is the one version of platelets. That's the other version of platelets. Platelets generally look like this. As they're chilling and running through your blood supply, they are kind of innocuous. They're small little marbles. They just roll right on through. But what they do is they serve as blood clotting mechanism. So when you end up cut, whether you have a damage to the inside of the blood vessel or from an external injury, platelets are going to pop into this weird spiky shape that looks like jacks, basically. And then they're going to adhere to the site of injury. And multiple of these guys adhering together are going to make a plaque or a clot that's going to allow the blood to flow past it. Right? Okay, so what does blood do? Blood's responsible for oxygen transportation as well as carbon dioxide delivery back out through the lungs. Um, also responsible for nutrients delivery, so from the digestive tract and the intestines. Responsible for transporting hormones and waste products throughout the body. So basically it's a delivery system. Red blood cells specifically focus on transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide, whereas white blood cells have a ton of different immune response functions. And again, platelets are responsible for blood clotting. So connective tissue-wise, it's generally found within blood vessels, but it's also going to be found in the bone marrow, et cetera, where the red and white blood cells and platelets are going to be produced. Okay, so now let's talk about muscle tissue. We have a couple different types of muscle tissue. We have smooth muscle, we have skeletal muscle, and we have cardiac muscle. We're going to start with skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is going to be really easily um, denoted because it has these striations, right? These striations 
are going to be these nice little lines that are found across. We also are going to have nuclei, so but, um, skeletal muscle is going to be multiple nucleated. And why is that multinucleated? Because we're going to need a lot of energy and a lot of, so we're also going to find a lot of mitochondria here for energy, and a lot of directions, so a lot of information to be coming from lots of different sources. Again, the nuclei are kind of the boss's office of the cell, so they're going to be telling the muscles what to do. Here's smooth muscle tissue. Smooth muscle tissue basically going to have the muscles aligned, uh, the muscle cells aligned next to each other, right? But we're not going to see the striations anymore, so it's not going to be uh, overly organized, right? Um, hectically organized is what I would call this one. It is kind of organized, but not specifically organized. And then cardiac tissue is very specific because it also not only has these striations, but it also has these intercalated discs which are going to allow for communication from one cell to the other. So that's going to look like these, these little intercalated discs. All right, so again, three major types, namely cardiac, smooth, and skeletal muscle, and you should be able to identify based on the images which one you are dealing with. They are completely different if you look at them under the microscope. Um, but they all serve for similar function, right? They're going to be um, con serve for contractile tissue. So cardiac tissue is going to contract constantly with the heartbeat. Smooth muscle is going to contract when needed, like contractions of the uterus, for example. And skeletal muscle is going to contract in a voluntary fashion when told to, to allow for body motion. Okay, so let's move on to nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is the primary component of the nervous system, obviously, including the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. The objective of the nervous tissue is to communicate from the brain to the rest of the body, namely the muscle tissue, via electrical impulses. We have two major cell types, neurons and neuroglia. Neurons are kind of princesses. These are going to generate and conduct the nerve impulses, and neuroglia are going to do all of the rest of their cellular functions. Neurons do not feed themselves. They not, do not bathe themselves. Do They do not dress themselves. The neuroglia are going to dress these princesses and bathe for them. So neuroglia are the supporting cells that take care of all of the rest of the functions, while these neuron cells focus specifically and primarily on the generation and the conduction of nerve impulses. Okay, so what does that look like? So here's a neuron. Neuron is going to have the cell body. The cell body is where we're going to find the nucleus. And then it's going to have two major regions. The dendrites are going to be the regions that are going to bring in information from the external environments or from other parts of the body, right? And then this is going to send information out through the axon to the axon terminals. So we have dendrites that bring information in and axons that send information out. And what does this look like if we're looking at this in a, um, underneath the microscope? Again, here's going to be our cell body. These are going to be dendrites that extend outward. Here's the nucleus of the cell body, and then here is the axon that projects, projects downward. We have multiple different ways that these signals can be set up. Again, signals are coming in from the dendrites and out through the axons. But they can do that a couple of ways. Now, we set it up based on the cell structure, but it's also going to be based on the cell function, right? Because form defines function in biology. So here, when we have what's called a multipolar, that basically means that we have dendrites coming in from multiple regions and we're going to send information out to the axon that's on a different region. In this case, this axon is going to be insulated. You can see this little region here. These are called Schwann cells. They're going to insulate so that that long nervous impulse, say this nervous impulse originates in the brain and goes all the way down to the toes, it's not lost in between the hips and the knees, et cetera, right? So this is going to insulate that electrical signal so it goes all the way down, again, to the axon terminals where it's going to fire in the muscle tissue. Okay, now here is what a bipolar nervous tissue cell looks like. So a bipolar um, neuron is going to have the cell body in the middle with one pole being the dendrites and one pole being the axons. Okay, so here we have the reason this is considered multipolar is because we can get a signal from any one of these dendrites into the cell body. This one is called bipolar because we can only get two signals in. One from any of the dendrites has to go through this axon into the cell body. And then this route here, although it is actually running out, is the other pole. So one pole in, one pole out. And this one is considered unipolar. Why? Because the same thing. We're still going to get information from the dendrites and send information out through the axons. But in this case, the cell body has its own driveway on the side. And so things coming in, no matter whether they're coming in or going out, are going to go out through that one driveway. So multipolar, many different driveways coming in. Bipolar, two driveways coming in unipolar, one driveway coming in, right? But these all these are still going to be doing the same thing, interpreting information from the environment around it 
running that information past the nucleus, and then interpreting what to do with that information and sending information out through the axon to the axon terminals to relay information either to another nerve or directly to the muscle tissue itself. Okay, so let's run back to that application question when we were talking about the small intestines and how it had all different types of tissue, including smooth muscle tissue. Um, the smooth muscle tissue is going to be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. The enteric nervous system is going to um, innervate the digestive tract. Okay, I've got the, en the enteric nervous system is a branch of the parasympathetic nervous system. System. The parasympathetic nervous system is a branch of the autonomic nervous system. Now, we haven't quite gotten to the nervous system yet, so don't worry if that seems overwhelming. But the point being that the small intestines is controlled by the ANS, specifically the enteric nervous system of the ANS. Um, and the following types of connective tissue are all going to be found in the small intestines, including lo loose areolar tissue found in the mucous membranes the blood vessels and the nerves, loose adipose tissue, which is found in the visceral fat surrounding the organs, um, loose reticular tissue found in all organs but, but also in the intestinal tract, um, dense irregular tissue found in the fascia surrounding the digestive tract, and blood, which is found in the capillaries within the digestive tract. So thank you guys all so very much for sticking it out with me today. I will see you next time. Have a fantastic day, and as always, 